everybody. My name is Patty King. I'm the Deputy Library Director of the Rockland Public Library. I want to thank everybody for coming to tonight's event, both of those in the room and those on Zoom. Um, before we start tonight's talk, I want to give you a couple of a few etiquette things, especially for the Zoom folks. Um, Zoom folks, please stay muted during the entire talk. Uh, you are welcome to put your questions in the chat box and Elizabeth will cover everybody's questions at the end of the talk. Before we start the talk, I am going to tell you about some upcoming events at the library. Monday, June 12th at 3.30 here in the community room, we are going to present a tech class on understanding cloud library. If you don't know what cloud library is, cloud library is an online platform where you can borrow eBooks and audiobooks. And to attend that class, you need a device connected to the internet and an active library card with a participating library. Next Thursday, the 15th at three o'clock here in the community room, there is a talk on the safe use, storage, and disposal of medication for older adults. This is presented with Penn Bay Medical Center. Two of their pharmacists will talk about um, disposable disposal of medication for older adults and they will have disposal pouches provided for free next thursday evening here in the community room and on zoom we will have a talk with bob trapani jr who has a new book called gleams and whispers main lighthouses and their allure he is going to have a beautifully illustrated program about main lighthouses and then next tuesday actually two Tuesdays, time, it goes by quickly. Two Tuesdays from now, June 20th, we will have our first lawn concert on the front lawn of the library, and that will be with the group New Shades of Blue. Their music evokes old time sunny nostalgia, and they do originals and covers. And when we do our um, questions at the end, I'm going to be like Phil Donahue. I think most of you will remember Phil Donahue and I have a handheld microphone and I'm gonna ask you to speak into the microphone with your questions so that everybody on Zoom can also hear you. And I wanna thank Elizabeth Garber for coming tonight. We're very excited to hear your talk. Um, Elizabeth Garber is the author of Sailing on the Edge of Disaster. She's also the author of Implosion and has published three books of poetry. Her essays have appeared in Salon, Maine Homes, Johns Hopkins Magazine, and more. And she received an MFA in creative nonfiction from USM um, Stone Coast program. And she also is an acupuncturist and she's been so for nearly 40 years. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. I'm going to turn things over to you. So we're going to do this team thing. So the first thing you get to see, one of the things when um, I was putting this book together and then getting ready to bring it out is um, I was the int part of the intent of the book was to really recreate the flavor of what it was like in the 70s. And when you're reading a book, you don't get the music. But I, um, I worked with David Berez in um, Camden, who does who's post office editorial. And I said, I want to create a book trailer with the music of the era. So um, we're ready. So you get to have a little um, flavor of the book. And the time. <laughs> In 1971, the Oceanic School leased the Sea Cloud, a four-masted, square-rigged yacht built in the 1930s by the businesswoman Marjorie Merriweather Post to be their school at sea. I chose to go. I sent myself to the Oceanics. My parents were like, if you're going to finish high school, then yeah, please go. She didn't even tell me anything. She just sent me off, uh, you know, and I arrived at the Antarna and I said, this doesn't look like it's going anywhere right away. <laughs> Whoa. 
There were 50 mostly American teens, students kicked out of the best boarding schools, Native American brothers, and naive Midwesterners who'd never seen the ocean, who were all sent to a neglected, yet once magnificent sailing yacht to learn to sail. I think when we first got there, the ship was sitting on the bottom. I mean, I think the tide went up and down. I don't think the ship went with it. I got out of the taxi with my duffel bag and looked at this and I thought, my God, I've come to heaven. On first glimpse, you think, ah, she's a little rough, but you know, with a little elbow grease, we can, we can get it going. You know what I thought? <laughs> I thought, what the hell did I get myself into? The students, teachers, and crew worked for three months to restore the ship. They spliced rope, scrubbed the decks, worked in the engine room and in water tanks, and climbed the rigging. When the school finally set sail, the students lashed 16 of the 30 sails to the rigging. But instead of clear sailing, their troubles were just beginning. There was a payphone, and I, rem I would call home once a week, and my mother had no interest in hearing about the ship but my dad wanted to hear all the details, and I kept thinking he would be shocked and upset about the terrible things that we had to do on the ship, and they didn't seem to be phased by how dangerous it was. No one knew that it was impossible. That's the only way it happened. We were all collected into the ship. The ship wasn't gonna float unless we worked it. <laughs> Let's work it. Let's yeah. make it live. For me, that, that was a momentous time. We were ready to take on the world. This is normal. This was normal. And that, that was part of what the late 60s and the 70s were about. I always feel really good. I always feel so happy after I see that trailer because it's like the music, the energy. And when we when we um, got the audio of us talking about the ship, David said, because um, I had found 12 of the 50 students who had been on the ship and I found four of the five of the 10 teachers who had been on the ship. He said, find the ones who are the best talkers, the best storytellers. So we created a, a Zoom call with Kim in England, Pogo in China, um, let's see, Zip wasn't on, um, my brother in New Hampshire, um, one of the teachers in California. We figured if you ever want to do an international call, 11 o'clock in the morning Eastern time worked just right. Pogo was like 11 o'clock at mid, you know, almost close to midnight. And so we just had this lively conversation and it felt like we were back on the ship again, just talking, but with this perspective of 50 years later and what an extraordinary experience it was. So anyway, let's see, now is the All right. So um Is a quote from the school director. This is great. <laughs> All right, so um, first off, I want to thank Toad Hall Editions of Northport, Maine. It's really hard to get a book published. It's really hard to, to find an agent, find a book, find someone who loves your book. And I was incredibly fortunate to have these three women who had just started during the pandemic, had started a small book publishing company at their house in Northport. And they said they, they wanted to bring this book out and they've done just a beautiful design and layout. And um, so I was really fortunate to work with them. So anyway, so how did this all started? Well, in 1971, I also, I, before this book, I wrote a memoir about my dad um, and growing up as a radical modern architect's daughter where we lived in a glass house. I knew the designer of all the furniture, the sculpture, modern sculpture. I was just immersed in modernism. But also we were immersed in um, working constantly to build the house and finish the house and then landscape the five acres around it. 
Um, but we also had learned too that we had to just follow my dad's orders. So my dad decided he was sending me and my middle brother to sea. Um, and we didn't have any voice in it or any, any uh, opportunity to voice our opinions of it. But my brother had always wanted to go to sea. And, um, but what had gotten my dad inspired was um, he was in a literary club in Cincinnati and someone came up to him with this article from the New York Times which described the first year of this school at sea. There was a couple that had a really challenged um, kids and they wanted to figure out a different way to do education. So they thought, put kids on a sailboat, have them learn how to sail a ship, have classes at sea, what could be harder than that? It was, um, every year was sort of a fiasco in its own way, except the year after our, my year was, they sailed 10,000 miles and had an extraordinary year. And um, I think my year was the most dangerous year. <laughs> but anyway, so, um, but he announced that my brother was going and then I was gonna go with him to his interview. And then he had decided that I was also a problem child and I was going, it was like, I hadn't, I hadn't, I'd seen the ocean when I was about six. I'd never thought about ships. I'd never thought about sailing, but he decided this was the solution for me. And I was gonna be the school librarian, which gave me an identity because I was sort of a depressed bookworm. Um, so, I ended up going to New York City that summer to work for the director of the school who was very charismatic and engaging. And um, this is still, you can see the tape around the edges. This is the picture of the ship that I got that summer that I've car carried in my wallet for years and that I've carried. And it was just this, this is the dream of the ship. This is what it looked like in the 1930s when Mar Marjorie Merriweather Post sailed it with a crew of 70 and with seven staterooms. And so it was like for a crew of 70 for maybe 10, 15, 20 people at a time and they could go out for six months at a time. Um, and it has 30 sails and it was magnificent. But when we got to it, it had been sitting on dock for four years. And we were a whole, this is not a professional looking crew. The, the kids in the sh on the ship, we were to be the crew working with a small crew of maybe um, eight to 10 um, crewmen or officers and then teachers. And the teachers discovered that they also had to be part of the crew and do the work of the ship. So anyway, I thought I'd read you about what it was like when I arrived on the ship. Um, the taxi from Miami airport drove slowly through a maze of metal shipping containers stacked three high. I clutched my sweaty cash and asked again, making sure I was in the right place Ashbury Docks, the Antarna, right? The driver pulled to a stop on an op open dock and through the windshield, I saw a rust streaked hull and a line of portholes. When I stepped out, the ship towered over me, a huge four masted ship I'd only seen in a black and white photograph. I gasped, holy shit. The ship was swarming with boys. There were 46 boys and five girls. Boys, teenage shirtless, long haired boys lined the railing of the ship and milled around on the dock and a lot of them seemed to be watching me, a skinny 17 year old girl in a white linen jacket and short shorts with new sandals and freshly shaved legs. I blushed from all the attention. A couple of tall guys with ripped jeans ambled down the gangway of the ship and walked over towards me. They were tan, dirt stained and grinning. You're here for oceanics, right? I could only nod. Cool, they said, before they hoisted my duffel and backpack from the trunk of the cab and carried them up the gangway and down the deck. I followed them, holding onto the railings until I realized how greasy they were and let go. But at the slight sway of the ship, I grasped on again, making a mental note, don't wipe the grease on my good clothes. Midway, I paused and looked down at that narrow chasm of dark water between the dock and the hull, and I shivered, this is the ocean. This is only the second time I've seen it. The rumble of a refrigerator truck compressor brought me back to a cacophony of noise. Hammers beating metal, vibrations of engines, and out in the harbor of Miami, cargo ships headed out to sea, sounding their deep horns. Tugs and ships churned wakes. 
I craned my neck to look up into the Antarna's soaring four masts. On deck, a tall guy near me stuck his head into a doorway where a current of hot oily air poured out and shouted, hey Woody, your sister's here. The guy looked at me and explained, he's one of the grease monkeys down in the engine room. So the guys on the far side are the grease monkeys, that's their outfit. I peered into the doorway where a metal ladder descended into a dark, smelly, deafening realm. I held onto the, dark, the heavy door handle until I realized how greasy it was and pulled back my hand. Where was I gonna wipe off my fingers? I stepped back as an oil-streaked teen emerged with shoulder-length hair held in place by a red handkerchief. I didn't recognize him. Hey, he said in a lackluster voice, we finally got here. It was Woody, my brother. He was so dirty, his skin looked gray. He gestured with his head towards the bow like he was embarrassed to be talking to his sister in front of the others. As we walked forward, I gushed, the ship is so beautiful. Are we really close to leaving? We reached the foredeck where a mast as big as a trunk of a mature oak was surrounded by a waterfall of heavy lines on all four sides. I looked up past the yard arms and I couldn't even see the top of the mast, but I knew the facts. Four mast, right? Goes 170 feet above the deck. Woody nodded. I'm gonna climb the main mast someday, even if it kills me to do it. Once you get to the top, you can hold on to a line, wrap your legs around it and slide down from the top. Crazy. Oh, Woody, you aren't gonna do anything dangerous, are you? He said, what on this ship isn't dangerous? His face was serious with none of his old sarcasm. What do you mean? We sat down on the deck and leaned against the railing. Rumor has it, the last crew on the ship wasn't paid. So when they left, they flooded the engine room with salt water. He grinned, I can appreciate their active revenge, but it made a terrible mess for us. He explained that no one had noticed for a few days and the owners drained the water and had the engine room spray painted so it looked new and clean when Stephanie and her husband took the tour about leasing the ship. At this moment, there are no working water pumps, no electricity, no engines, no galley, no working heads, almost nothing works on the ship. He was dead serious. I know I'm only 15 and all I know about sailing ships came from reading books about the Napoleonic Wars but I can tell you we're in big trouble. I said, but Woody, it can't be that bad. He said, well, we haven't sunk yet, but it's still possible. But Woody, if it's really dangerous, shouldn't we go home? But the moment I imagined home, I clenched inside. This school was our escape. Being home for a week after the summer in New York reminded me no matter what was happening here, it was safer here than home. The ship had to sail. His answer was swift. Hell yeah, it's dangerous, but I won't go home. No way, I'm actually having a great time. And he grinned. So that gives you just sort of a sense of where we started. Um, and there it is on Ashbury Docks in Miami in 1971. And so we just start, so what if there, there was one um, telephone booth on the dock so people could make a, a uh, collect call home if you wanted to call home, but mostly we wrote lots of letters. I wrote in a journal, and when I got home from the ship, I created a big photo album that I carried around with me for the next 50 years until it was time to start writing the book. Um, so we started to learn how to work on a ship. We learned how to um, stand at muster. We learned how to do lifeboat drills. We learned how to scrub the decks with salt water, um, the coops of um, cement on them. We're going down this really narrow opening into the fresh water tank where they could only be down there 10, 15 minutes at a time before they'd pass out from the heat. Um, and they had to scrub the rust off the inside of the tanks, wash them down, and then um, paint them or seal them with uh, a cement paint. Um, in 2019, my husband and I went back to the, the ship is now known as the Sea Cloud, and it's this luxury sailing yacht, and I figured out the shortest trip, I could go on it for four days, out of the Canary Islands, and we went onto the ship, and just, because people kept saying, aren't you going to have to go and do research, and remember what it sounds like, and I kept saying, no, I can't afford, and I was like, Oh yeah, I really go, need to go do research. But it was a really good idea because I had forgotten all the sounds and the way it feels to walk down a deck and then practice. I 
figuring out how to describe that, walking down a deck, how it, and we didn't go on the rigging, but I watched them go up and down in the rigging and just that feel of when a ship is sailing and the feel, the light and the sounds of a, being at dock and then out in the water. So, but when I asked them about things like going down in water tanks, they said, mostly no one ever goes down in a water tank, but if you did, you'd have, um, a monitor that monitored all the gases that could be in there. And it was, they just kept saying all these things we were doing. They did not think it was funny. It was so seriously dangerous. Also, now when people go up in the rigging on sail training ships, they've got a safety harness and they've got, they can click in as they go up. We had no safety equipment. We were climbing up and down and going out on the yard arms with what people had always done. There was, we just held one hand for the ship and one hand for you. Um, also, um, because the, the owners of the ship had had the ship re-rigged and everything redone in Italy four years before, and they brought it back to the United States and the United States government required customs duty on the whole ship, not just all the improvements. And they didn't have money for that. So they let the, the ship sit in the harbor for three and a half years. So what happens if you let a ship sit in a tropical climate, the rigging starts to rot. And we didn't know that until we were on board. And then we had a rigger going up there and every so often his foot would give way. And, um, and the sh we had to re-rig all the running rigging, all the ratlins and all the running rigging, not the standing rigging. Um, also, how thick do you think the barnacles would be after four years of sitting it was like over a foot thick. Um, so the scuba diving class got to have applied work. They got to learn how to go down and start scraping. They had to, the main, most important thing to scrape off were the water chests so that we could get fresh water coming into the engines. Um, the, um, the propellers were bronze, so they didn't have that much um, Barnacles on them, but the rudder did. Um, so there was just a lot of work to get it done so we could even begin to limp to um, dry dock. And we ended up going all the way to Veracruz, Mexico for dry dock. So we went a long way with a ship in incredibly precarious shape. But um, before we even left Miami, we had re rigged all the ratlins and we started our sail training practice going up in the rigging. And there's a great scene in the book where I get frozen in total fear up on the second yard arm or up on the second platform. But after three months, miraculously enough, we finally had some crew. We finally had engineers come on and we actually had things in rough enough shape that we could limp out of there. And, um, and then by the time on our way to dry dock, we started putting up some of the sails. And, but once we got out of dry dock, we didn't have a hole in the side of the ship. We had things were like really looking up and we were on our way. We were gonna sail around um, the Yucatan and go to Panama. We were going to go through the canal. We had been promised free passage through the canal by um, the Panamanian consul because our ship was registered under the Panamanian flag. So we were gonna to go to the Galapagos Islands and then sail and have get back to work on our classes, do biology, and then go back through the canal down along the South American coast, across to Africa, up to the Mediterranean, up to along um, Northern Europe, and then back across and end up in Miami. That was the plan. The next year they actually sailed 10,000 miles, but um, we got to Panama and the, um, the owners of the ship had decided after the school had put in $400,000 worth of work and materials, the, the, that young director of our school was a tireless fundraiser and raised all this money to get all this work done. And the owners decided now it's time to get rid of these kids and let us start um, uh, chartering the ship. So they got to Panama ahead of us. They had officials bribed and they um, they had a uh, 
uh, drug search when we first arrived. I'm going to find you. Um, all right. Um, anyway, I don't have that pulled up, but we were, they we arrived in Panama and then they said we're going to do a search the next morning and these PT boats arrived and they had the owners, their lawyers, they had officers and they had about 10 um, soldiers with um, um, assault rifles and they came on board and we were you know, the kids were all clustered together and they were gonna search, they searched every inch of the ship. Amazingly enough, they didn't find anything. But it was strange, by the time they left, the soldiers were friendly and giving us a peace sign, like we were cool. And it was like, oh, great, we're gonna get ready. We're gonna be able to go through the canal. But, um, and then we had a day in town and then we were supposed to load up with water and food. And um, we came back to the ship and we were having dinner and the captain, came down into the mess and he put up his hand and he said, I was informed by radio that Stephanie, our school director and her assistant were arrested this evening when they went to shore. They've been taken to jail in Cristobal. The room was stock still, all of us staring at us. He added, the PT boats are back. They're guarding the ship so we don't attempt to escape. In the stunned silence through the open portholes, the throaty gurgling of high powered engines idled on either side of our ship. The reality sank in. We were trapped. Our questions ran wild. Are we being held hostage? So we were held by armed guards for the next 10 to 12 days. It's sort of unclear from, you know, from journal entries and letters how many days we were actually held, but we, we were almost out of water and almost out of food when they started. By the end, we were out of water. They opened up the um, alcohol cabinets because so they could give the kids something to drink. They emptied out all the food that was left in the pantry. We were, you know, we had caviar, we had, you know, pasta boiled with as little water as possible. Um, and it was the trade winds had just stopped. So it was really just hot and still. And we were just sitting there on, on deck. And then there was a cargo ship that was um, at anchor quite close to us. And the captain realized when the tide turned, it was going to come over and it could hit us. And it was so big that it wouldn't even notice it. So at dawn or before dawn, he asked one of the kids from the engine room to go up on deck and um, get the anchor chain engine going and start pulling up the anchor chain quietly. You can't do it quietly. Um, just so that we could get the ship drifting a little bit away from this cargo ship. And the um, one of the PT boats that was right nearby, they started yelling and started yelling and they shot at this kid um, with a machine gun. Um, he's, he felt it go right over his head. There were my two best, one of my friends was up on, on the bridge with the captain, looking down, seeing where this kid was on the fore deck with the anchor chain. And then this other friend of mine was in the bowsprit net wanting to watch this, the, the, um, sunrise and he thought he was d dead. He thought he was gonna die. And then um, they dropped the anchor chain again and that's when the captain said, we've got to get these kids out of here. Um, and we finally surrendered the ship and surrendered because we kept hoping that we would kept doing something or negotiate or making enough calls home because we had Mary Tyler Moore's son on board. We had some really wealthy kids on board and then the, then they were offered that three VIP kids could leave and the rest of us were gonna sit there. And the captain said, nobody's leaving until we all leave. So we, thought we ended up, this is our last view of the ship after we had emptied all our gear and all our stuff off the ship and left. And um, some parents um, came up with a farm in Puerto Rico and, we, and some other parents came up with chartering a plane and the remaining kids and the teachers went to this plane and flew to Puerto Rico and wait, wait. And Stephanie, the uh, ever um, dynamic school director came up with a second ship that was that sank the first day out. Um, so anyway, it's, it's a lively adventure story <laughs> um, with a lot of characters, teenage characters and um, 
and crazy adults. Right? <laughs> so any questions or anything I can tell you about the ship? Oh, and, um, and if you want to hear a long um, interview, there's a woman who does wonderful podcasts of interviews with memoir writers. So yes. How long was the ship? Yes. 360 feet, four masted. Um, um, how many sails? Oh yeah, microphone. Right. Um, how um, many sails? 30 sails. We got 16 of them up. And they were um, Welsh linen. They were exquisite. They had been in this special, um, one of the rooms had, um, kept the humidity down and was really protecting them and we got them up and then, oh, so once we left the ship and the owners got the ship back, we don't even know if they went on the ship. They couldn't find anyone to lease it to and they let it sit there for the next six years. All the rigging rotted, the teak um, boards on deck, you know, just warped and the engine and everything just started rusting. But fortunately, there were, and people would sail through there. We would hear reports of people had sailed through the Panama Canal and would see the ship just sitting there and just watching it rusting and the sails falling down into lace. And but fortunately, this um, a German company came up with the money and a crew that got it to limp across the Atlantic. It's absolutely astounding they got it across and then it went into about two or three years of renovation and and then it's been a sailing yacht um, for passengers since um, about 1979 it's about 1980 so you've told me how many um, sales on, on the full sail yeah now um, depending on wind conditions um, you um, you what, don't need what, all those sails for regular. What's that? You don't need all those sails for. Right. Um, and, and, and it's not a skillful ship for sailing. Okay. Um, so you, usually you have it lined up. You get the, the angle of the mat, the um, yards going with how you want the, the wind behind you and just carrying you along. You, you can't do anything quickly on a square rigger. Um, also, it probably in the design. They thought four sails looked better aesthetically, but three sails would have been much better in terms of sailing. So um, you you were saying, if I understand, um, you could not point in this, but you were kind of at a reach or a we're run? on a reach all the time. Okay. Yeah. Um, so what's great is when the ship every year it sails in the Mediterranean in the summer, and then it goes to the Caribbean in for the winter. So they go down past the Canary Islands to, what are those next islands? I forget. Um, and then they just go on the trade winds and do a yeah. 10 mile or a 10 day crossing. And it's supposed to be magnificent. I bet. And one final question. When you say the PT boats, is that what the same boat that John Kennedy was famous yeah. for? Yeah, and McHale's Navy. <laughs> so um, that was an American built they were American um, built World War II. And how did these fast. Panamanians get a hold of them? I don't, that's a really <laughs> good question. That was, I'm, I think a lot of countries sort of get things left over from other places. Sure. So yeah. they were World War II PT boats. And I remember some kids going, oh, they couldn't be too dangerous. It's World War II. You know, this was in the 70s. They said, oh, no, these are really fast, quick sure. boats. And Ironically, we had snuck out of Veracruz and gotten into international waters 14 miles out when we, um, the owners were trying to get the boat back in Veracruz and we snuck out at night with all the, all the lights out and, and we got to international waters. But in um, the Gulf Coast of Panama, there's only a really narrow opening and there was no way we could have snuck out with all the ship's traffic and gotten to international waters without being stopped quite dramatically. So wow. we did. Fascinating. Thank yeah. you. Did your experience on board give you a, a uh, love for sailing? Have you sailed since then or did you I've give just, it up? I've just sailed a little bit. And when you've, I, when you've sailed a 360 foot ship, right, um, it's an extraordinary experience to steer a ship that big. And after you get, there were a couple of us girls who were really good at it. 
and you start to feel like your whole body's the ship and it's and the the wheel is so I mean, subtle and you just do a tiny bit this way or that and it can get going off but it's just an amazing experience but I've I've sailed with some other people I've at different times I've thought I was going to learn a lot more to sail but it didn't come my way I did other things ironically on the ship I became a writer I wrote in a journal sometimes 10 pages a day so what I've kept doing since then is I've kept writing I'm just curious, listening to you, your emotional state at that age on the boat. Did you cry at night? Were you have? I mean, what were you scared all the time? Or we. Um, what's funny is um, there's one of my friends from the ship said, "Why are you calling it or talking about it being dangerous or whatever?" I don't ever remember it being dangerous, and it's you know how teenagers think they're immortal. So. Um, you get used to things being dangerous and you just sort of and the first you know the emotions of teenagers it's like are we being held hostage what's going on and then you just sort of get used to it and we were stuck there and kids complain or we read a lot of books while we were being held hostage and we wrote in our journals and we watched and we hung out and we listened to music and thinking somebody's going to figure this out and we would have great conversations of who's going to get us out of here and we were sure it was Mary Tyler Moore. But about eight years ago, when I started doing research to start getting ready to write the book, I started hunting down on the internet and finding people who are on the ship. And so one of the people I found is a Native American Cree man who lives in middle of northern Alberta. And I had an hour and a half conversation with him and took incredible notes. And I learned from him possibly the story of how we got out. And it wasn't anything that any of us thought. What I realized is Native Americans can, they can pass from one country to another um, in all of, the, all of the Americas. And um, so the, the sister of these two Native American brothers worked in Ottawa and worked with the chiefs, the Canadian chiefs. And the, the Native tribes in Canada are subject to the crown rather than to the Canadian government so that they they were under Queen Elizabeth. So supposedly the chiefs at Ottawa contacted the English government or the Queen and then supposedly according to his story the Queen contacted Nixon and supposedly Nixon said these are just kids let them get them out of here you know let them go. So that is one story of how we got out. Nobody really knows how we got out. But um, it's sort of a, a wild thing to piece a story together from the memory. I, I set up a, a private Facebook page for all these people that I found. And I would ask a question. And we'd get tons of emails going back and forth and posts. And people, I said, there was this book about the sea cloud where they interviewed the, our captain, who was a Swedish captain. There weren't many captains who were still um, licensed for sail and for um, generators, for a, um, both in a you know a major powered ship and a sea sh sailing ship. So, but probably about 10, 15 years after the ship, they interviewed him. And I said, this is crazy. He says in this interview, we were shot at. We weren't shot at, where were we? And these other kids said, oh no, we weren't there. And then these three people said, oh yeah, we were. And they had never told anybody else that this had happened. So, it was, so I kept finding out all these things that I didn't know until I'd started doing this research. So in a way, we got to go back to the ship. I got to talk and ask questions and do all these things that I didn't hadn't done when I was 18. So it was like, getting to have that experience again um, in a in an amazing way and like rewriting certain scenes and going into that memory of going back into that moment and what happened and how and remembering the sights and the sounds and the senses it was like re-experiencing the the ship so you get it a second time when you write a memoir any other questions So did your father, was he pleased with your year, uh, your last year of high school or whatever um, year it was for you? Oh, he actually came down and came to the ship when we were still in Miami and he built the books for the library. 
um, and he was, my, my father was bipolar. So the first week he was great. And then by the second or third week, he got really nuts and decided to announce that he was going to stay on the ship for the whole year. And my brother and I said, no, you aren't. <laughs> you stay, we're leaving. Um, so he uh, um, cut us off and said we couldn't ever come home again and that we were disowned. And, um, and we went, okay. So at the, we knew at the end of the year, we didn't know what we were gonna do, but we did go home. And so if he had a short memory, he forgot and he was sort of, things got better and then things got worse the way they always would do with someone who's bipolar. Yeah, but it, it was life-changing. It got me out of being sort of, I really learned that I could be stronger than I thought. Um, and that I could manifest things. And my brother and I had, while we were on a second ship, we had been offered jobs as crew on ships going across the ocean. We could have done lots of things, but it, it helped me get thinking that I could just do whatever I set out to do. And it, it really was a life changing of um, time in my life. And I really appreciate that my dad sent me there. And I got a good story out of it. <laughs> Yeah, any other questions or any thought? Any th questions that come up on came up on Zoom? There's one that was like the bombing that I saw. I'll trip okay, <laughs> double check. <laughs> oh, when I gave one of my first book talks, it was up in Northeast Harbor. And not that many people can get to Northeast Harbor, but on Zoom, there were about 40 people. And there were a lot of kid people, I still call us kids, kids from the ship. And so there was someone from England and someone from Costa Rica and in the United, different parts of the United States and they stayed on Zoom afterwards and we had this little mini reunion. We were so excited to be talking about it and that they had seen the whole book taking, you know, building over the process of the five years I worked on it. So they really cheered me on and um, helped make it a much better book. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I don't know. It was built in Germany in 1931, um, so right at the beginning of the Depression. Um, I think in, um, I don't know who designed it. I know that Marjorie Merriweather Post had this, had rented a huge um, dock or on the docks of New York. She had this huge upstairs loft and she had it painted the shape of the the ship and then the staterooms. And so she designed and figured out the layout of the staterooms. And then she designed what furniture and what things would go into each of the rooms. Each bathroom or each head on the in the staterooms had a different kind of marble, a different design of gold fixtures. There was a fireplace in the master um, suite and there was a fireplace up in the living room on board and the living room on board upstairs living room dining room is all wood paneled and paintings and there's a, sort of a spiral staircase going downstairs and yeah you go into another world when you go on um into the state rooms yeah in the their pictures in the book about the sea cloud all right thank you thank you all for coming